YouTube. My name is Trey. Welcome to Work Out of Change. Today we're going to be talking about the, the different sides when it comes to, once again, gender affirming care. We're going to hear something from a doctor and we're going to hear something from Mr. Minster. All right, let's get into it. Reduces opportunities for women. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mailman. Mr. Minter, uh, now you may begin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shannon Minter. I'm the legal director of NCLR. It's a legal organization that represents LGBTQ people. For my 30 years with NCLR, 20 years as its legal director, I've represented many transgender young people in cases involving discrimination and harassment in schools, in the child welfare system, the healthcare system, other areas. Recently, I've been involved in federal challenges to state laws that ban medical care for transgender young people and completely ban them from school sports. I really appreciate the opportunity to address this committee. You know, parents should have the freedom to make health care decisions for their transgender children. Parents want what's best for their children. Americans differ about a lot of things, but there is one point on which we strongly agree, and that is that parents, not the government, are best situated to make medical decisions for their own children. There's a lot of misinformation about transgender children, youth and adolescents. Gender dysphoria is very rare, less than 1% of the population. Most people in this country don't know a transgender person, much less have they met parents with transgender children. For most people, most legislators, this seems like a new issue, but medical care for transgender adolescents has been available for more than 20 years. The very same medications being prescribed for transgender youth have been prescribed for other young people for other conditions for more than 40 years. There is a substantial body of research that shows these treatments work. They improve mental health outcomes, quality of life, social relationships, family relationships. They dramatically reduce suicidality. One federal judge, after a full trial, said there is now extensive clinical evidence showing excellent results for these treatments. The medical standards for these treatments, as has been noted, have been endorsed by every major medical association in this country, American Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Psychological Association, many more. These standards, they're evidence-based. They require a rigorous multidisciplinary assessment before diagnosing a child with gender dysphoria. They take a conservative approach to treatment. Those standards have been in place in a long, for a long time. They are not new. What is new is this recent massive overreach by state lawmakers to ban medical care for transgender youth. These, these laws, these recently passed state laws, they prevent doctors from doing their job. They prevent parents from getting the medical care that their children need. And that is why every federal district court, all six of them, after hearing all of the evidence, have concluded these bans violate parents' rights, they violate equal protection, and the claims they put forward to justify the, justify the bans have no basis. These decisions, as has been noted, have been issued by a wide range of judges, Arkansas, Alabama, Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee. In every case, the state officials supporting these bans had every opportunity to back up their false claims with actual evidence. Each case, they have failed. These bans pose a serious threat to the health and safety of transgender young people across the country. And I urge the members of this committee to reject any federal attempts to replicate that harm. As a transgender person myself, I have benefited from decades of access to health care, legal equality, support, I've been able to marry, have a family, pursue a career, participate in my local church and community. It is very disheartening to see the protections that they've given me and other transgender people so many opportunities to thrive and to succeed now just being needlessly taken away from young people. Healthcare bans conflict with medical expertise. They rob parents of their right to make medical decisions for their children. They have devastating consequences for young people's lives. Decisions about children's medical care should be made by the parents who love them not by politicians who know nothing about a child's life or history or circumstances and who won't be the ones having to watch a young person they love suffer the devastating consequences of going without needed medical care. Thank you. I want to talk about what this individual said about gender dysphoria. So according to the DSM-5, right, 
zero uh point zero zero five percent of males are born with gender dysphoria diagnosable and we have point zero zero two percent of females that are born with gender dysphoria and that number only gets as high as point zero zero three percent for the females and point zero one four percent for the males so think about that not even like less than a percentage we're talking about point zero zero five percent of males in 0.002% of females will be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Think about that for a second. So for somebody to say, oh, you know what? This is going to have a massive impact if we don't have gender care uh, things on these children, that we don't give them puberty blockers. It is such a small part of the population, a very small part of the population, to say that it would have a massive impact. And there are tons of kids that want to take their lives if this doesn't happen. It just doesn't make does it. It just doesn't make sense because even if we talk about the people who are born with gender dysphoria and that low, 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 low percentage, how many of them would actually take their lives if they didn't have puberty blockers? How many of them could even understand what it means to have gender dysphoria up until they're 18 years old? That's why we're what's what we're talking about. We're talking about the children here. What are the chances of somebody who's in the point zero zero five percent of the population also having every one of those people wanting to take their lives? If we really did a true percentage of how many kids were born with gender dysphoria and also want to take their lives if they didn't get the surgery, I mean, didn't get the puberty blocker and stuff, that number probably goes about 0.00005%. It'd be so, it'd be so abysmal. It'd be so small, astronomically small, that it makes no sense for us to, every child, for us to have every kid who walks into the clinic who says, oh, you know what, I have gender dysphoria or whatnot, give me puberty blockers. I like how he said, and I believe this is a woman who's a transition to a man, but because I don't know, I'm just going to say he, because this individual talks about, oh, you know what? We're having a massive overreach, massive overreach coming from the state locals and state governments saying that we shouldn't be able to do this because you got to understand that the vast majority of these people, even though it's a small percentage to begin with, the vast majority of these kids are going to grow up and you know what's going to happen? They're not going to want the puberty blockers. They're not going to want to go on the HRT. They'll probably just go on to live their life of whatever they are, right? The probably and this person said they're part of the LGBT. And y'all know how I feel about saying that if a person doesn't, if a person, is a, a little boy um, doesn't say that they want to play with uh, blue toys or they don't want to wear traditionally manly clothes or anything like that, that they might be a female. But the only other option is that they aren't a female, which is what the LGB might argue, is that if they aren't a female, then that must mean that they're gay. Listen, I'm also against that. I don't think either way we should put any labels on these kids. You let them be whatever they want. If my child or anything like this, and I, I don't see this happening, but it, it's possible. My child was to come out and say, you know, dad, I'm this and that. I don't like to play with blue toys and stuff like that. And he wanted, he didn't necessarily want to dress as masculine as possible. He's not going to be like me with a, a, a collared shirt, tie, all this pants and all this kind of stuff. He, he might want to wear the color pink more often or stuff like that. I am not going to tell my son that either he's a female or I'm going to say that he's gay. And I'm not going to let anybody else who would say that about my son or my daughter, because I will put no label on my child. If they make that decision when they're adult, they make that decision at the door. We got to stop putting sexuality on kids. If they want to say that when they are out of the house or they are finally an adult, they want to do that, then that's on them. They will live that life. But I don't believe that if you are this or that or this or whatnot, that you're automatically gay or you're a female or you're gay or, or you're a lesbian or you're a boy. Stop putting labels on kids, period. So I'm also against any teachers or anybody teaching kids, kids these sexualities as if they have to choose right then and there. Oh, am I straight or am I gay? Or am I a little bit of both? Blah, blah, blah. Everybody's different in this world. There's feminine men and there are masculine women. There are going to be some men who, there's going to be some boys who, how they grew up, they might be a little bit more romantically attracted to men because of some reasons. There's going to be girls who are more attracted to, uh, girls because of how they grew up and stuff like that there's a lot of stuff that goes into it there's so much nuance that it's just crazy to think that we can pinpoint it down to oh he didn't like this gay he didn't she didn't like this lesbian oh he didn't like this girl oh she didn't like that boy i just hate that we bring it all the way down to it and i feel like that's what we're doing with these kids because we're expecting them to make such a intellectual nuanced decision at 12 at 13 
these kids are struggling to do their math homework. We see the IQs of our children are falling. When you look at the statistics, children aren't be getting more intellectual and being able to comprehend things more. They're just getting more manipulated by social media and the TikTok. But let's move on to the other side of the argument. Thank you, Mr. Minter and uh, Dr. Bowens. Last but not least, you may begin. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Scanlon, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Dr. Jennifer Bowens, and I'm a licensed therapist, clinical researcher, uh, currently serving as the director of the Center for Family Studies at Family Research Council. Based on over 25 years of experience as a clinician providing trauma therapy to children, and as a researcher investigating the psychological effects of traumatic uh, stress, I'm here to express my concern about what has been termed gender-affirming care. I've considered it a privilege to practice, research, and train future clinicians and be a part of a discipline aimed at protecting and bringing healing to the most vulnerable in our society, which are children. But when it comes to gender transition procedures, my field is not operating as a helping profession. Instead, it is actively causing harm. Historically, children have been treated as a special and vulnerable class in the psychological and research fields. Caution has been applied to children in light of the fact that they do not have the neurological capacity to understand lifelong decisions. Professional and research ethics tell us that we should proceed very cautiously with regard to interventions for children when empirical evidence is weak or the research methods are in the early phase as with this case. We should avoid interventions that pose unnecessary risks, particularly when the symptoms are known to change with maturation. But risk avoidance is not what's happening with gender transition procedures. Instead, we have too many cases like Mike. Mike was nine years old when he first saw a gender therapist. I was deeply saddened when I read his gender therapist case notes where it was reported that Mike couldn't distinguish between fantasy and reality. Instead of investigating these symptoms, the therapist wrote in the treatment plan, um, which included puberty blockers, guidance on social transition, and education for future hormonal and surgical procedures. This treatment plan was enacted without regard for this child's known diagnoses of autism, possible OCD, and possible parental diagnoses, which were reported in the case notes. Mike is just one example of how so-called gender-affirming care is in direct opposition of, knowledge, of our knowledge regarding development and our understanding of good research and uh, treatment. And there are many reasons why I have concerns, but I'll just share a few with you. Uh, one, these interventions are being endorsed based on consensus, not evidence. Uh, in, the, in the case of gender-affirming care, the term evidence-based does not mean that this practice is standing on the merits of solid research findings addressing gender dysphoria. Instead, it refers to a vote by those who are ideological supporters of the practice. Compared to other psychological disorders found in the DSM-5 TR, gender dysphoria is currently uh, being treated with the most invasive, invasive interventions connected to a psychological issue with the lowest quality of evidence to support that practice. And two, the success rates of non-intervention for gender dysphoria for children already exceed what most psychological interventions have. In most cases, 85% or more of those experiencing gender dysphoria will desist if they are left alone. This is a higher rate than most well-established and researched psychological interventions. And with success rates this high, it is actually unethical to intervene. Three, the research and practice around this uh, issue does not properly account for competing diagnoses and variables. So in one example, a report from the UCLA Williams Institute found that 45% of transgender identifying people reported childhood sexual abuse. As a trauma clinician, I can tell you that when someone experiences sexual trauma, it is not uncommon for that person to hate parts of their body or want to get rid of those aspects of themselves that made them vulnerable to abuse. And four, it is often claimed that a failure to provide these interventions increases the risk for suicide. This approach is actually unethical and it's a clear departure from the practice of empowerment and self-management, which are important goals of mental health practice. 
This claim is also not supported by the literature. Despite years of empirical study, there is no definitive understanding of the etiology in the suicide literature. Five, after a review of the literature, other countries have actually backed away from gender transition procedures, and the list now includes the United Kingdom, France, Finland, Norway, Australia, and Sweden. And six, and last, uh, gendered affirming care has created a monopoly on treatment options as it demands that it is the only way to treat gender dysphoria. By comparison, um, we can look at uh, Cochrane collaboration, for example. Um, there are 245 meta-analytic reviews of varied treatment options for depression. Yet when it comes to gender dysphoria, there's only one path currently prescribed to uh, help someone, and that's to become someone else. Researchers and clinicians should be innovating solutions to heal distress, not coercing kids onto a path that tells them that they need to remove or change physical parts of who they are in order to be whole. This is why I'm calling on you to act on behalf of children. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for that. Very beautiful, very beautiful. I just, man, that last part hit me pretty good. I'd already heard this obviously previously, um, but just hearing it again, hearing that, hold on, guys. Hearing that, yes, at the end of the day, it seems like there's only one way to get through all of this, change completely who you are. That's what I've always been saying. And that's what I've been hearing. And obviously I listen to other people and that's just what I've been hearing is that the only way to get out of gender dysphoria is to change completely who you are. And that's, I am so against that because they preach love and all this other stuff. And that's the way to go through. Just like they told the woman earlier, Miss Chloe, when they told her, would you rather have a, uh, a live son or a dead daughter? It's like, that can't be the only option for gender dysphoria is to have surgeries, puberty blockers, and take irreversible drug effects. She said there was 200 and what, 45 different ways that people talk about to get through depression. But gender dysphoria is only one way. Change completely who you are. And she also goes on to talk about how all these other countries are starting to back away as they start to look at more of the, the science. They start to look more of the studies. They're like, okay, hold on. Let's take a step back. Maybe we shouldn't go forward with all these surgeries and all these irreversible effects, especially when it comes to children, because we know it's going to change the rest of their lives. We have to take a step back because nothing based off what we have seen is going to help them uh, move forward in this life. Also, she talks about how when you uh, leave these kids alone and allow them to just live their life, it, it tends to dissipate. It tends to just go away. It, it tends to just slowly, as they get more and more help, it tends to just, they just tend to come back into a normal life. And she said that at this high success rate, it just is unethical for us to intervene at 11 years old, at 12 years old. She talked about a young man who was nine years old. We should just leave these kids alone because they would just grow up to live whatever situation they want to live in. Because every time we try to intervene and get them on puberty blockers, get them on HRT, get them on everything, then we start to say, you know what, just go ahead and ruin your life. Because at this moment in time, at this point in your time, at 11 years old, when you could possibly live to be 75, this one year of your life, you, yeah, we absolutely got to take you, put you on puberty blockers, take you, put you on all these drugs and just make it to where your life can be irreversibly damaged. Just like Miss Chloe, who can possibly never have kids, cannot breastfeed, and she's going to be dealing with the trauma, and she's going to be dealing with the physical ramifications for the rest of her life of what happened to her. She's only 19 years old. All because at one moment she thought she wanted to be a boy. That's it. That's all it took. One thought. And I like how she says that there's so many different ways we do depression. I understand. And I want to go back to saying there's one way to get out of gender dysphoria. My issue with that is that people don't even try to explore that to the deepest depths. Somebody just comes up to you and says, I want to change my gender. People are like, all right, well, let's get you on this, 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 this. Here are the pros. Here are the cons. Uh, the cons aren't that bad, though. But the important thing is that you're going to save your life because if you don't get on these drugs, you're probably going to want to take your life. There's nothing that even says anything about that. People think that if a child or somebody has one suicidal thought at one point because they don't like their life, that that automatically means that if they don't take a certain drug, that they're going to take their life. That is just not true because a lot of us go through a depressive state, even as children. I can't tell you how depressed I was as a child. It was a lot of times I thought about taking my life, but I didn't take any drugs to get through it. I talked to people. People loved on me. We got through it. And though my parents didn't know what to do with me, there were other people in my life that didn't know what to do with me. Were there kids in my grade that took their lives ultimately? Yes. But those kids didn't take their lives until they got older, right? A lot of the kids that I saw take their lives when I was in high school, 
they took their lives at like 18, 19 years old after school had already ended, right? Because they did have the support system. But once they lost that support system, once they got out of high school, because there wasn't so many kids around, there wasn't so many people, and you get out, you get that whole summer where you know you're never going to see your friends again, possibly. That's when a lot of those kids took their lives, right? And while I, I say a lot of kids, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm meaning a lot as like, as those kids who were kind of pushing towards that place, right? It wasn't a lot. I think one or two of my friends actually took their life and then a family member of mine took their life. But it's not such a drastic point to if a kid just has one suicidal thought, you have to give them drugs or they're going to feel much better. That is not dealing with the issue. That is not dealing with it at all. If I say that if I don't become a boy, I think I'm going to take my life. That does not mean that you're going to have to put me on all these drugs or I'm going to go through with it. Kids have these thoughts it does happen and i know it's scary as a parent it's scary as an adult but it does not mean that the second a kid comes out and says they're depressed or anything that we just give them a million drugs and say oh you got to do this because if you don't you're going to die that's not how you want to do it because what ends up happening is these kids get older after taking all these drugs and realizing that life does not change that much and they still going to have to look in the mirror and still not like what they see and they still want to maybe one day finally take their life it can still happen that way. It's not that it's, I'm not saying it's likely. I'm just saying that this, this, this concept that if you change exact everything about yourself, that you're just going to love yourself for the rest of your life. You go walk up to so many people in this world who are not transgender, who don't have gender dysphoria. Go walk up to the normal human being and ask them, are you perfectly okay with what you look like? Do you love your body? Do you this? Do you that? A lot of people are going to say no. Right. Because people get in this concept that only transgender people or people who have gender dysphoria are the only people who go through this um, go through this depressive state where they don't like what they look like. They can't stand what is on their body. We a lot of us go through that, man. A lot of us go through that. Maybe we're not necessarily going to the part where we say we don't like our genitals and we need to cut them off. But there are people in this world who look at themselves in the body and wish they could just do anything in the world to get it all done. There are people who will go through extensive surgeries, people who will make their waists slimmer. There will be people who put stuff on their face. They will do anything not to have the nose they have, not to have their eyes be as close, not to have the hands they have. They want to have longer legs. They want all this beautiful stuff in this world. Everybody wants to change themselves in some way because they compare themselves to somebody else or they look at something else and say, that's the real beauty. And then they want to change all of this stuff. We all go through it. It is not a, just a gender dysphoria thing. I'm not knocking gender dysphoria because I know it's a true mental illness. But to say that transgenders are the saddest people on the earth, it's just not true. A lot of us go through depressive states. A lot of us go through midlife crisis. A lot of us struggle with being a parent. A lot of us struggle with being husbands and wives. And a lot of us think, man, well, I don't know if I can keep going on. I don't know if I want to keep living this life. I'm tired of having to pay these bills. I'm tired of looking at myself in the mirror. Why am I so fat? Why am I so skinny? Why am I so short? Why am I so tall? A lot of people go through all of this kind of stuff and they want to take their lives but they act like only transgender people can even begin to experience anything in this life of slim, slim, slim part of the population are the only people who ever, ever go through depression or ever go through sadness or ever go through anything that's hard. And I tell you again, the social media and TikTok and all this other stuff, it's gotten people believe that it's so prevalent that only these people go through it. And it's just not true. The LGBT, I promise you, is not the only people who are depressed. I promise you that. Stop believing the lie that there is no other way to go through life unless somebody affirms and validates that you're gay, lesbian, trans, or bisexual. That is not the that is not the answer to all your solutions in life just because you can come out of the closet and feel like you, <gasps> you can breathe. Dang, I wish I could come out of the closet and be like, man, I wanted to be white for a long time in my life. <gasps> Guess what? I'm still black. You know, it's just like one of these things. You just have to learn to accept who you are and love who you are and live life to the fullest, the best you can. We're all going through something. We're all going through this stuff. Please leave the kids out of them. Let them get through it. OK, it'll be OK. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. If you like this video, like and subscribe. I know this has been a lot today, but uh, these have been long videos in these last few videos, but. We want. I need. We needed to talk about every one of these people's responses and get uh, our opinion on all of them. So, anyway, with that being said, y'all have a great day. Goodbye.